God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in and through me so that if I, as I open my mouth, uh, that your people would be encouraged and you would be glorified in, in everything that takes place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're continuing in this series called Living In and Out of the Psalms. And over the course of the last three times that I've spoken, because Kevin and I have been kind of tag-teaming on this, on this um, series, but the last three times that I've spoken, I've, spoken, I've focused in on the wicked, which is something I really don't care to do, but it's something that God has really kind of laid on my heart about, about wickedness, about some things that are going on in our, in our culture, and just how we would, how would we kind of work through that um, as well. Because there's a lot that the Bible, or a lot that the Psalms actually, the Bible as well, but the Psalms have to say about, about righteousness and about, about the wicked. There are numerous psalms that show the difference between the righteous and, and the wicked, what the righteous are like and what the wicked are like, what the characteristics of, of both of those, those kind of uh, groups of people would look like, and, and what are the different futures? It talks a lot about that. What are the different futures for the righteous and, and for the wicked? And a few weeks ago, we talked about Psalm 1, where, where the psalmist there actually encourages us and says that we would be blessed if we did not walk in the counsel of the wicked, if we did not stand in the paths of sinners, if we did not sit in the seat of, of mockers, that we would, be, we would be blessed. Our lives would end up being blessed as we, as we walked out that way. And that we would be blessed if we would just meditate on, on the Word of God. That if we would take God's instruction and we would just kind of live that out in our lives. That we would be, the psalmist encourages us that we would end up, as we did that, we would end up being like a tree that's planted by the waters. That its roots go down really deep into that into that water or that spring of, of Christ and that our leaves would be vibrant and they wouldn't wither like some of ours are in the dryness around here um, now. And that we would actually bear fruit in our, in our old way or in our old ways, in our old age. And, but he also says, but that's not true about the wicked. He says the wicked are going to be like chaff that just gets, that gets blown away by the wind. And they're not going to be able to stand in the judgment. And they're going to be destroyed because of their wickedness. And then last week, we just kind of begin to talk about what do we do or what do we not do when people succeed in their wicked ways. Because sometimes we see people succeeding or it looks like they succeed in their wicked ways. And David, who we're going to talk about a little bit today, um, is the author of, of Psalm 37, and he just tells us not to fret, not to get all heated up. How many of you remember what the Hebrew word for fretting is? Connor, what's the Hebrew word? Chara, my man, take you to lunch today, like I do every Sunday. <laughs> nothing new for Connor at all. Chara! And it just means to just not get all heated up when wicked men succeed in their ways. Don't become envious, David said, of, of those who do wrong. Don't fret because of the wicked. Don't be fret because the wicked, because it only leads us to, to evil. Then David tells us in there what to do. He says, but trust in the Lord and, and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pastures. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And we talked about all that last week. But today, we're going to kind of continue to, to talk about the wicked, but we're going to do it in a, in a bit different direction. Because today and next week, we're going to talk about what are we to do when we find ourselves become the wicked? Ooh. 
who drift into the temptation of the world's philosophies. What do we do when we drift into our own fleshly desires? What do we do when we take the bait of Satan and we just kind of run with it? What do we do when we make the choice to live contrary to the word of God instead of live in the word of God? What do we do when we make the choice to live to, what do we do? I saw, Kevin, am I on? Huh? The podium mic's on now? Okay. I'll let Kevin come and fix me. Could you hear me now? Okay. All of a sudden I realized I went away and I was still here all at the same time. <laughs> Which is really a weird feeling. I'm not here. Oh, yes, I am. All right. What do we do when we take the bait in Satan and run with it? What do we do when we make the choice to live contrary to the word of God? What do we do when thoughts, when thoughts of wickedness enter into our hearts? Because I have thoughts of wickedness that sometimes enter into my heart and into my thoughts. What do we do when, when we do that and when we actually, when we begin to act on that? What are we to do when the things that I want to do is not the very thing that I do and the things that I really don't want to do? Daggummit, that means seems to be the things that I do. You see, we can all relate to that. We all understand that. What are we, do, what are we to do when we begin to live contrary to who we are in Jesus Christ? What do we, what do, we do? What are we to do when, when, when what we do misrepresents God and actually then misrepresents who God has called us to be. What do we do when those things happen? What are we to do when a little deception turns into total deception? What are we to do in those places? Isn't this great? I can just keep talking to you and somebody just keeps messing with my behind back here. That just shows you how, how concentrated I can be on this. I hope you were, I hope you were as, as well. Well, today and next week, we're going we're gonna to spend our time around Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 is, is a psalm of David. It's, it's called a penitential psalm. If you think of penitentiary, think of being in jail but getting out of jail. It's a penitential psalm. Psalm, and a penitential psalm is actually this: is a penitential psalm is where the writer of the psalm actually acknowledges or confesses his sin before the Lord and recognizes his need for God's favor in his his life. And there are seven different penitential psalms in the in the books of of Psalms, and these penitential psalms are really a great reminder for each one of us of how easy, for us who believe, of how easy it is to kind of drift from God, to begin to drift from God's word, begin to drift from God's promises, begin to drift from God's purposes and God's plans for us, from God's blessing for us, and begin to live a bit contrary to who we are in Christ. You see, the penitential psalms also, and this is what we're going to look at next week in Psalm 51, but the penitential psalms are actually a model prayer. They're a model prayer for confession and repentance. They're psalms that we can use actually as we're walking through our own stuff, and we'll get into that a whole lot more next week. And Psalm 51 is, is really that kind of a, a psalm. It's written by David as, as a result of a real-life situation that took place in David's life. And we're going to look at that in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12 for today. And it's a story, that, that passage in, in 2 Samuel, is a story about a godly man. It's a story about a believing man. It's a story about a man who God called a man after his own heart. It's a story about God's person. It's a story about a man of great faith. It's a story about a man who honored God with his life, most of his life, almost all of his life. 
It's about a man with, a, with this known calling from God, a man who had been called by God to be king over Israel. He wasn't just called by God. He was called by God to be a king and anointed by Samuel to be a king. He was a successful man. He was a successful man monetarily. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of riches that God had given him. He was a man, he was a man who, was, who was successful spiritually. He was very strong spiritually in his walk with, with God. He was a man who had fought many battles, militarily as well as internally. He'd fought battles out there, but he'd had to fight a lot of battles in here, too, in his life. And he'd been faithful to the Lord. But he's also a man, as we're going to see in here in just a minute, who drifted from godliness, who drifted from that righteousness and drifted to sin and wickedness in a matter of just a few choices. Just a few choices. Now, I want you to understand that I was just going to go into this just a little bit, the story that I'm going to go into today and we're going to talk about. Because I was just going to talk about Psalm 51, and then I was just going to give you the background to Psalm 51 real quick. But as I went back through and as I read this story, again, went back, and I know the story. Many of you know the story. And as I went back and I, I read 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 12, God began to raise some things up in me, some, some thoughts about what had taken place here. And so God just kind of laid it on my heart to do this before next week we do the other. So today we're going to spend our time looking at David's story and then gleaning from his story how easy that it is for any one of us to find ourselves adrift in the world. Because sometimes it's really easy for us to do that. Then next week we'll, we'll look at how to come out of that sin and out of that wickedness and come back to, to God. But as you came in today, you were, you were kind of given this, these things of, of ten thoughts on how we can drift into sin, which actually it wasn't written out that way. It was 10 thoughts on Psalm 51, but it's really, it's really 10 thoughts on 2 Samuel 11 and 12. So if you want to grab that out, you can follow along. And I'm just going to run down through some of these thoughts that came to me as I wrote them down and as I read the passage. Here's the first one, and that's this. Drifting begins when we slacken the rope that anchors us to God. We haven't untied it yet. We haven't untied the rope. If you can just kind of think about yourself out in the, out in the storm, out, in the, out in, the, in, the, in the water that kind of tosses you here and, and there. We haven't, we haven't necessarily untied the rope yet, but we've slackened the rope. And we slacken the rope when we forget who we are, when we forget who we're called to be, when we forget who God has made us, what God has saved us from. And what God has saved us to. And David began to drift when he forgot who he was. David was the king of Israel. David was the head of the very armies of Israel. He was highly successful because God had made him highly successful. But in 2 Samuel 11... Verse 1, it says this, and we see where the, the rope kind of got slackened a bit. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite am army, and they destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rahab, or Rabab. You see, they were still out there warring, but it says, but David remained in Jerusalem. Actually, one translation says, but David stayed home. You see, David was a king, and kings were leaders, and kings 
went out with their armies because David was the king of Israel and David was fighting against the enemies of God. And David was called to lead people in the fight against the enemies of God because God had given them the land and God had told them to go in and take the land. And he had anointed David as the king over that land. And so David's army was going and fighting against the Philistines. They were fighting against the Amorites. They were fighting against all the other rites that were in the land that God had promised. And David was called to this. But for whatever reason, David kind of stayed home. David decided, I've worked hard. I'm going to chillax just a little bit. I'm going to put in for some vacay time. And I'm just going to stay here. Joab, you go ahead. I'll be praying for you. Good luck with that. And here's the point of this, this first thought that I wrote down. That when we relax in who we are in Christ and who we're called to be in Jesus Christ... When we're feeling successful in ourselves, successful in ministry, successful in our calling, or just successful in, in life, the marriage is, is great. Family and friends, they're doing good. Finances, spot on. They're really good. Businesses, that's kind of on the uptick. Even though we're in a pandemic, we're good. Everything's good. God is good. All the time, and all the time, God is good, and life's good, and we're good. We're good. But the problem with that is, when all that's happening, when everything's good all the time, and it feels good, and we're good, we can begin to slacken the rope. We can begin to slacken it up a little bit. Because things are good. Now, there's nothing wrong with things being good. And I think we need to worship God and thank him that things are good when they're good. But that doesn't mean we're still not who we are. Doesn't mean that we're still not in the battle. Doesn't mean anything like that at all. It just means that God is in it with us and we're in the battle that's there. But one of the things that we need to understand that David, I think, kind of forgot was this, that the battles aren't all just out there. The battles are in here. They're in here. You see, we do a lot in our country right now about talking about what's out there and what they're like and what the wicked are like. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. My finances are good. My marriage is good. Everything else is good. They're bad. I'm good. I'll fight my battle out there. But see, we can begin to lose the battle here. And that's what was happening with David. That's part of what happened to him. You see, temptation, which we're going to talk about in just a second, can come when we are the most vulnerable, when life is just bad. <sighs> Life's just bad. I just feel like giving up. I just feel like giving up. And we, we, can, we can move into that temptation. But what I want us to understand is also, it can also come when we're at the highest point in our life too. And right here in this place, David was at some high points in his life. They were winning battles like crazy. Read chapter 10 just before you go to 11 if you go back and read it, okay? You'll see what God was doing for them. And David's just going, I don't need to do this. God's got this. I'll just I'll send Joab out there. I have, a, I have a brother-in-law who passed away a number of years ago, not from what I'm about to tell you, but he was an alcoholic. Went to his AA meetings, came out of alcoholism, went to his AA meetings. He'd be going along, and all of a sudden, he'd take a little dive. And then he'd come back out of it, and he'd take a little dive. Then he'd come back out of it, and then he'd take a big dive. And then he'd come back out of it. 
One day I was just talking to him, and he looked at me, and he said, Daryl, I want to tell you something about my alcoholism. I don't go back to my alcoholism when things are bad. I go back to my alcoholism when things are good. When I think I've got my crap all together, that's when I drift. That's when we can drift. And we need to understand that. It's when we can drift. Here's the second thought. Drifting begins or stops. Whoops, where is that? Can you go back? Is there one back? Drifting begins or stops with the temptation. Now, what I want us to understand, and I always say this, temptation is not sin. Temptation is just temptation. It's what it is. Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, but was without sin. So temptation is not sin. Temptation is temptation. But Scripture also says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has seized us except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. But along with that temptation, he will provide a way of escape so that you and I can stand up under it. Now we can go to the next one. Here we go then. And James said this. He said, I want you to understand something. When you're tempted... No one should say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone else. But each person becomes tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. It's a transition that we're going to look at here a little bit. That's, That's there. You see, there are, there, you see, we resist temptation in two ways. By focusing and anchoring ourselves in God's word for us and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, or we drift from temptation to sin when we ignore God's word and entertain the thoughts of the tempter. Those are the two ways that we can go. You see, when we don't recognize or choose God's way of escape, we begin to walk out our own way. And we untie the anchor. Let me say that. We untie the anchor rope. And we set ourselves adrift. Okay? We do. And again, David (laughs) chose the latter of those. Look at verse 2. It says, one, even da- one evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace because he was home, because he could, because he had some extra time. From the roof, he saw the, a woman bathing. A woman with, the woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah. The reason I highlighted those is because I think that the messenger was telling him who she was and that could have been his place of escape. She's Bathsheba and she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But Davis dismisses the fact that she was married to one of his soldiers and and sent a messenger to, to go and, and get her. Again, David chose um, the latter. And it goes on to say this. So she came, and he slept with her, and then she went back home, and then she conceived, and then she sent word to David, and she said, hey, I'm pregnant. And so it begins. And so it begins. So here's the third thought. There are two things that we can do with our sin once we've committed it. We can confess it to God, which we're going to talk a lot about what that looks like next week. Or we can excuse it. We can hide it. We can find a way to make it go away. And we can deny that it it matters, really because everybody else is doing it, and move on. 
You see, to confess your sins to God means to begin to retie our anchor rope to God. But to excuse it and to hide it means to continue to stay adrift. Which kind of brings us to this fourth thought. And that's this. That at every point of our drifting from God, there is a choice to be made. At every point, there is a choice to be made. It may be a difficult choice. It may be difficult to say. It may be difficult to come before God with. But every time we have that choice. But again, David chose the latter. So it goes on to say in verse 6 that so David sent this word this, this word to Joab. He said, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent, him, sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah came to him, David asked him, hey, Joab, how's it, how's it going? How's, how's the battle? How's Joab doing? Everything good? Everything all right? Pause with paraphrase here. But it's really what he was doing, making some small talk. Then David said to Uriah, uh, why don't you just go down to your house and, and, and wash your feet? Otherwise, why don't you go back to your home and just relax with your wife? So Uriah left the palace and a gift, and the king sent a gift after him, which I, I, when I read that, I wonder, so did Bathsheba get the gift and think it was from David, and Uriah never showed up because Uriah doesn't show up because it says here. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and he did not go down to the house. And when David was told Uriah didn't go home, he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Because that was my plan that that you would go home, that you'd be tired of hanging around with guys and you would go home. And he didn't go home. Can you feel the frustration? I can. But Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah, they're all staying in tents and my commander Joab, Joab, and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How on earth could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I would not do such a thing. Dang, says David. Then David said to him, okay, then just stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David got him drunk, hoping he'd go home. Okay? But in the evening, Uriah, who was drunker than a skunk, still had his principles and went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. And he did not go home. Dang! Plan isn't working here. So, which brings us to kind of the fifth thought that's there. And that's it. God won't allow our cover-up plans to succeed <laughs> because he loves us too much and wants us to come back to him. We may try all we can do to cover it up for everybody else, but God just doesn't help us in our cover-up plans that are there in our lives. I wrote this down after I wrote that down. And I just wrote this down. God will never allow us to dismiss our sin. I want you to hear that. God will never allow us to dismiss our sin. But God will never dismiss us because of our sin. Any more than any of you would ever dismiss your children because of their misbehavior. They're still your children. 
and you still want the very best for them. Again, David had the opportunity to, to, retie the, to retie the anchor, but he chose to continue to drift. Do you know anybody like that? They just come up to it and go, yeah, I know, but, yeah, I know, but, and if you don't know anybody out there, do you know anybody in here that's come to that point? Maybe some of you are feeling that right now when I'm talking about this. Because, see, David had the opportunity to choose life, but he continued to choose death. And he had the opportunity to step out of the darkness into the, into the light, but he still chose to hide in the darkness. He refused to bring that out into the light that was there. Now, because the plan didn't work, he sent Uriah back to the battle, and he just devised another plan. Go to the next one, please. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, and he actually sent it with Uriah. Can you imagine that? Hey, Uriah, take this to Joab. And he sent it with Uriah. All right. I just know me. I think I'd look at the letter. But Joab was a person of principle. Or, um, Uriah was a person of principle. Uriah put, in, in, in it he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he'll be struck down and die. You know, there would be one more in here. I decided not to put it in, but I'm just going to throw it in here at us. And, and that's this. Sometimes we, in our own cover-up, bring other people into our cover-up and make them part of the cover-up. So while Joab had the city under seas, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. And Joab, Joab sent David a full account of the battle. Next one, please. The messenger sent out, set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had, had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men outpowered us and came out against us in the open. But we drove them back to the entrance of the city. Then the archers, those darn archers, shot at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David told the messenger, look at this in verse 25, I want you to go back and I want you to just say to Joab, don't let this upset you, Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as, as well as, as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. There's some irony in that, that as I was reading it, I just went, are you kidding me? I wonder if any of that was a comfort to Joab at all. Say to Joab and encourage him. In this, here's the sixth thought. There's a place in this drifting away from God where our unconfessed sin begins to turn into our way of life. Let me just say that to you again, because this is a scary place. There's a place in this drifting away from God where our unconfessed sin begins to turn into our way of life. When we drift too far away from God's word, we begin to become very different than who we are. And in David's thinking, what was wrong somehow had become right, and what was right had somehow become wrong. There's a place here where this whole thing gets flipped in our thinking, in our attitude, in where we are as, as people. You see, somehow the ends justify the means. Look at what happened just in this very short period of time. David's 
unconfessed sin has become now his unconfessed wickedness in the eyes of the Lord. And we see that in verse 26 because it says this. It's verse 26. Oh, there it is right there. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned him. And after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And God was just not willing. Well, let me just put, let me just put the seventh thought here, and that's this, that even though no one else may know about her sin in our life, and our life has seemed to return to normal, God still knows. God still sees. You know, when I was going through this, I was thinking back on all of David's psalms. And when I thought about this, that God sees, God knows, think about Psalm 139 that David wrote. That even in my mother's womb, you knew me even when I was in my mother's womb. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I go? If I go deep, you're deep. If I go high, you're high. Was there something that happened in David that he didn't see that anymore? Or was there something that happened in David that he was so far down that road that he didn't know how to get up from it anymore? So I might just well keep going down the road that's there. So what God did was send him a, another godly man, <laughs> a prophet named Nathan, to confront the sin that David was really unwilling to face. And so this is what, what happened. The Lord sent Nathan to, to David, and when he came to him, he said, there were two men, he told him this story, there were two men in a certain town. One of them, one of them was rich and the other one was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle. He had a bunch. He was, he, he was rich. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he, that he bought. And he raised it, and he, and he grew it up with him and his children, and it shared his food, and it drank from his cup, and, and it even slept in his arms. It was, it was like a daughter to him, Nathan is telling us to David. Now, a traveler came to the rich man's house, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his sheep or one of his cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, what he did was he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man, and he prepared that man's ewe lamb for the one who had come to him. And it said then that at that point in time, David was infuriated. David was white hot. David was charred, okay, about this whole situation. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. Ouch. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and he had absolutely no pity. I'm going to put together thoughts eight and nine with this right here. And here's, here's eight, and that's this. We become so deceived about our sin that we don't even recognize it when we're told about it. We don't even see it in ourselves. You see how far down the road you can go with this? How far a person can go down the road with this? And then nine, thought nine. We can become so angry about the sin and the wickedness of others that we don't even see it in ourselves. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you try to take a speck out of a man's eye while you got a log in your own. That's what it means right here. That's what's happening right here. Then in verse 7, it says this, Then, Lord, then, then Nathan said to David, you're the man. And it wasn't like, you're the man. It was like, no, you're the man. You're the man. And this is what the Lord, the God, God of Israel, says to you. I anointed you king, David, 
over Israel. And I delivered you from the hand of Saul. And I gave your master's house, meaning Saul's house, meaning, the, meaning Saul's place, your master's house to you. And I gave your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you all, is all, you all Israel and all of Judah. And if that had not been, if that had been too little, David, I want you to understand something, man. I would have given you even more. So why did you despise me? That's what it means by the word of the Lord. Why did you despise me? By doing what is evil in my eyes. You struck down Uriah. Here it is, guys. Here's what I want us to understand. Because when God gets out in front of us, when God begins to set down in front of us, when God begins to get up in our grill, all of our excuses, all of our stuff, all of our lies, all of our cover-ups, all the stuff that we did. See, we had that opportunity to do it back there, back there, back there, back there, back there. But now we're up here. And this is what God says. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you took his wife to be your own. And you killed him, listen to this, with the sword of the enemy, with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Next slide. Then David said to Nathan, Okay, I've sinned. It's me. I'm the man. Can I just tell you something? That's where God wants all of us to get. It's where he wants us to get. Because it's there that restoration and redemption and hope can take place. I've been a David. I've been a David. I've lied my way out of more things than you can shake a stick at. But God would always bring me back to that place. I'm not saying, yeah, Daryl, you're the man. Usually it's, yeah, Daryl, that I was telling myself, you're the man was what got me in the predicament in the first place. But there's something about when God says to us through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you're it. You're it. You can put it over here. You can put it over here. You can excuse it. You can say it's okay. You can do whatever you want to. You're it. And God wants us to get to that place that you're it so that he can begin to restore. Which brings us to thought 10. And that's this. God desires for us to recognize our sin, to confess our sin, to turn from our sin, to accept the consequences of our sin if there are consequences to be had, and there were consequences to be had. Because God said there will be consequences for what you've done, David but then learn the lessons from our sin. And what I want you to do is I want you to come back next week because it's really important because we're going to watch David walk through all this. We're going to watch how David walks through how a godly man comes back out of his wickedness, back into his godliness and what that looks like in our lives. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. But to close, let me just read from you 1 John's. And it kind of summarizes all that we've talked about um, today. It's in 1 John 1. And it'll just be up here. 
This is the message that I've heard from him. And declare to you, John says, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. But if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out of the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. My Bible says all unrighteousness. Verse 8, if we claim that we're without sin, then we're actually deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And he will purify us. I love that word. He will purify us. You'll hear it next week. It's called cleanse me. He will purify us from all unrighteousness. But if we claim to have not, if we claim we have not sinned, then we make him out to be a liar. And quite honestly, his word isn't even in us anymore. All of you take a deep breath. Because these are hard words. These are hard things to look at. These are, these are hard things to... But, but the grace of Jesus Christ, we overcome these things by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We can never get so far down the road that God can't get farther down the road than we are. We can't. We just can't. And he'll keep jumping in front of us, and we might keep ducking and dodging him, but he'll keep, he's faster than we are, and he'll get there, and he'll stand there. Okay, here you come, Daryl. I'm right here. And he'll do that in our lives. Let me pray for us, okay? God, we like the verses that tell us how good we are. We don't always like your word that tells us sometimes how bad we can be. The thing that I appreciate, Father, is you take us with all our goodness and all of our badness. And you convict us. And you lead us towards righteousness. And you restore our souls. I pray that today's message, Father, would be a message not of, not of condemnation, but a message of, of conviction and a message of hope. that there is always hope. That you are always about redemption. You are always about restoration. You are always about us returning to you. And as we return to you, you say that you will return to us. Help us move through that chasm that sometimes divides us even though we're your children in deep relationship with you, we sometimes can be your children that are far out of fellowship with you. Renew us, restore us, draw us back. Wherever we've slackened our rope to the anchor of our soul. Help us tighten it. Help us retie it. Help us to move forward. Help us proclaim that you are able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or think about. And that you will as we come to you. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all of that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. As we stand for this last song, I would like to extend another invitation for you to seriously consider coming Saturday, the 12th, to the park. And there is nothing like the redemption of Christ. Bring a neighbor 
bring a loved one. There's going to be testimonies here at the park. And we are, we're experiencing the Lord speaking in our midst. And this last song is about word of God speak. We're believing God to speak to our community on Saturday. And we believe that he will. We believe if you bring someone that they will hear the Lord speak. So set aside Saturday at 6 to 8.30. Come to the park. Let's stand together and, and sing this last song as a prayer. Oh, 